All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to NSTA Web Seminars, where you can find live interactive learning at your desktop. Today's seminar is titled NSTA Science Update, the Exploration of Europa, an Ocean World in Our Backyard. Our presenter is Louise Proctor. My name is Ruth Hudson, and I will be moderating today's program. Flavio Mendez is online with us to provide technical support. And now I'd like to introduce today's presenter. Louise Proctor is the director of the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston, Texas, where she oversees a number of activities that serve NASA and the planetary community, including scientific research, education and outreach, conferences, library services, and intern programs. Dr. Proctor has been involved in robotic planetary missions throughout her career. She has served on the Galileo and Near-Earth Asteroid Rendezvous missions, on the Messenger mission to Mercury, was a deputy project scientist for the Europa Clipper mission, and, in, and is co-investigator on that mission's camera team. She is currently the PI of the Trident Discovery Mission Concept, which would send a spacecraft to Neptune's moon Triton. Dr. Proctor earned her PhD in planetary geology from Brown University. Welcome, Louise. Hi there. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, now, I'm just taking control of the slides. Hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Yes, we can. Oh, you sound very, wonderful. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. So, very excited to talk to you tonight about my favorite solar system object, the uh, moon of Jupiter, one of the moons of Jupiter, Europa. Um, so, just making sure I can move the slides. All right, sorry, bear with me a second. I should be able to control these. Share. I clicked on the, hang on, it took a little while to get this going last time, so. So you should, you should be able to click on the screen to take control. Yeah, I can see the screen. I'm just having trouble forwarding the slide. So we're just trying to make your poll go away because it's right in the middle of our screen here. So there's an X at the top of the right. Okay, now I have control. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Small technical difficulty. Let's do that again. All right. Okay, so Europa. Um, just to give you an idea, I think you all know that Europa is one of Jupiter's moons. Um, this is an actual photograph from the Voyager spacecraft showing Io on the left and, uh, sorry, Io on the right and Europa on the left. And for those of you that are familiar with Jupiter's red spot, um, the Earth would fit about three times into the red spot, and Europa is about the same width as the US, so it's pretty tiny, but I just love this image uh, because it really shows us um, just how uh, massive Jupiter is and how small Europa is. Um, if I go to the next slide, these are the moons of the solar system, the larger moons of the solar system, um, moving from Earth outwards to the Kuiper Belt, uh, with Earth for comparison, and uh, you can see Jupiter is the fourth column from the left, and Europa is the smallest of Jupiter's four large moons. Jupiter actually has, I don't know what the current count is, but it's something like 70 moons. Most of them are small, rocky, irregular bodies. Uh, but the four largest satellites um, are all spherical, and they are some of the largest um, non-planetary bodies in the solar system. So first of all, this talk is going to be in three major parts. The first part, I'm going to talk about a little bit about the, the past history of Europa exploration, really, that we as humans did from the ground. Um, and I know that your science teachers are not history teachers, uh, but I, I think it's really important to understand how challenging it is to look at other planetary bodies and how long it took before we really started to see them as worlds in their own right. Um, so the first 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history, starting with the uh, first astronomers and then moving into the space age. Um, 
the bulk of the talk is going to be um, about Europa itself, some of the characteristics of the surface, uh, the geology, just things we know about it and what we know about its interior. And then the last 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about the future exploration of Europa. So what is coming up uh, in the next decade or so uh, for Europa? So first of all, um, as you may be aware, the, the, the four large moons of Jupiter were found uh, in 1610, so over 400 years ago by the uh, Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei. Um, he was the first person to point the newfangled, newly invented telescope um, at the solar system and to record these four points of light that he called little stars. And you can see on the right, this, these are his actual sketches. And what he found was that he pointed his telescope at Jupiter each night for several nights. And he found that these little stars seemed to move. And this was a, a really big deal because this was the first time that anyone had established that a small body was moving around another planet in the solar system. And so this um, confirmed the, uh, at that time, fairly heretical Copernican idea that um, planets were moving around the sun instead of everything moving around the Earth. Um, so it must have been a pretty exciting time. So um, as I say, Jupiter was one of the first people to, to discover these large moons, and they are named the Galilean satellites in his honor. So if I refer to them as the Galilean satellites, it's these four moons. So Io is the closest, then Europa, then Ganymede, and then Callisto. So names based on mythology. So it was another couple of hundred years before anyone uh, was able to have the first guess at the mass of Europa, how heavy uh, it was Europa. Um, and they got that to within 10% of the current value. And that was actually a French mathematician called Pierre Laplace. So uh, those of you who are mathematics teachers will know all about him. Um, about 50 years after that, uh, someone um, was able to estimate the size of Europa, the diameter of Europa from edge to edge. Uh, and actually, in both cases, they got it pretty close to the modern value, but this was all done with telescopes on the ground. It was another 50 years after that, so again, now 300 years after Galileo, um, that the, someone suggested that uh, Europa was a low-density body, and that means that um, they thought it might be fluffy. And in fact, one idea was that it was uh, comprised of, of a bunch of comets that were all going around the sun together. Um, 20 years after that, uh, it was shown that Europa was in what we call synchronous rotation. So one face of Europa was always pointing towards Jupiter as it went around Jupiter. So this was the same as the Earth's moon. Uh, we always see the same face of the moon pointing the Earth. Uh, and then in the 50s, um, the great American chemist Harold Urey suggested that there might be water flows on the surfaces of these uh, Jovian moons. Um, and this is the first hint that they might be icy and they might have ice volcanoes on the surface. So again, like, you know, again, 350 years since Galileo. Um, another thing in the 1950s that proves to be important to us later in our story is that Jupiter was found to have a really massive magnetic field uh, that contains a lot of plasma, so a lot of ionized gases, um, similar to what we have around the Earth. They're called the Van Allen belts in the Earth. Um, and this was, you know, just the first time we'd sort of found this through uh, radio signals primarily. Um, in the 60s, this water ice idea um, was proposed even further. Uh, and I love this photo on the bottom right. This is an astronomer called Fred Whipple. Um, and he's actually showing what he thinks the nucleus of a comet looks like uh, with this giant snowball. And the idea being that comets are basically giant, dirty snowballs. And the, uh, as they get close to the sun, the ice melts and you're left with just a dirty lag deposit. And it was thought that the, the surface of Europa might be the same, it's very bright, and so it's thought to be water ice on the surface. And then in the 70s, we started uh, having the technical capability to do color um, and infrared measurements, so going beyond the visible part of the spectrum and getting at the temperatures of the surface and starting to understand what the composition of the surface was made of. Um, so for the first time, like it's been, over 350 years, we're finally starting to see that Europa actually has, you know, it's made of certain things, it's got texture on the surface, um, the temperature of the surface, these things are sort of known. So we didn't learn much more about Europa for a while. So then we got into the dawn of the space age. Um, I don't know if any of you were around in 1957, but that was when Sputnik 1 
was launched by the Soviets. It was the first artificial satellite to go overhead. Must have been a pretty scary time, uh, I think, to be in America. I wasn't in America at that time. Um, uh, but it was a year later that the US started launching its first uh, rockets into space. Explorer 1 satellite was um, sent up in 1958. And then from 1958 to 61, there were multiple missions from the USSR and the USA, mostly to the moon and then to Venus. And most of those actually were unsuccessful. They would crash, but we learned something every time. And just, you know, it, was, it must have been an incredible time to be in space. So why, how does this all relate to Europa? Um, in 1962, NASA had sent a mission to Venus. It's called Mariner 2. And they started to think, well, if we can go to Venus, you know, what's stopping us from going further out into the solar system? Um, and so they began to think about what missions would they fly, and where would they go, and what would it take to do these, these spacecraft missions? And this led to something called the Grand Tour. And this picture is actually a card from a box of tea, right? They used to give out cards in tea. I remember my mom used to get cigarette cards in her packs of cigarettes. Um, and so this is a card from a Brooke Bond, the Race into Space card from 1971 uh, that shows pretty much what the Grand Tour would look like. So uh, the sun is um, the dot sort of on the left-hand side in the middle and all the uh, lines around it are basically the orbits of planets. And what these engineers uh, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, realized was that there would be a very unusual opportunity in the middle of the 1980s where a lot of the planets of the outer solar system would be in alignment. They'd be very close together in their orbits. And that this uh, would not repeat probably, for, I think it's something like it's either 80 years or 160 years, probably 160. Um, so... Oh, yeah, sorry, 170 actually says it on the card. I should just read my own slides. Um, so why was this important? This meant that if they launched uh, one or more spacecraft to the outer solar system at this time, they could potentially visit multiple bodies with one mission uh, instead of sending individual spacecraft to these bodies, which can be very, very expensive. So the, hence the Grand Tour was born. Um, there was a concern, however, and the concern comes back to, um, you remember I told you about those radiation belts around Jupiter. There were two concerns, actually. One was that engineers were so worried about the radiation at Jupiter, they thought it would fry any electronics of any spacecraft, that a spacecraft could not survive uh, the radiation. And the other pro problem they had was that um, they had to fly through the asteroid belt. And they knew the asteroid belt was, of course, full of asteroids and dust, but they didn't know how much was there. And they were worried that a spacecraft that went through the asteroid belt would end up getting basically sandblasted and destroyed by little chunks of rock floating around in the asteroid belt. And so what they decided to do was, before they sent the Grand Tour spacecraft, which ended up being two spacecraft that were part of the Voyager mission, they sent the Pioneers. Um, Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11. And Pioneer 10 and 11 were designed to fly out past Jupiter to see if they could survive. And so this is the first image of Europa from a spacecraft, the first time anyone saw it not through a ground-based telescope. Um, this is in 1973, and it's very, very fuzzy. Um, you know, it's very different from what we expect from our spacecraft images today. Nevertheless, um, this is a very important image. Um, even though it's fuzzy, you can still see there are some kind of dark patches along the bottom um, where you can actually see that there are some markings on the surface, but they didn't know at that point what they were. But the Pioneer missions proved that you could survive the asteroid belt, they proved you could survive the radiation at Jupiter, and they took measurements of the Jupiter environment, Jupiter atmosphere, and so on. So this then paved the way for the Voyagers. The Voyager spacecraft were some of the most successful spacecraft NASA's ever flown, or anyone's ever flown. Um, there were a pair of them, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Voyager 1 launched in 1977. So this was also very quick. Like They built these and launched them within a few years of the Pioneer results coming back in. Um, it, Voyager 1 made its closest approach. That means it flew... Uh, as close as it was going to get to Jupiter in 1979. And it returned a, a bunch of different data on the moons. Uh, Jupiter has rings, not everyone knows that, they're very faint, but it has rings. Um, it measured Jupiter's magnetic field. It measured the radiation environment, all these nasty charged particles. 
um, and it actually discovered active volcanoes on the innermost moon Io. Uh, but it also took this image of Europa that you can see on the right. And here now we're starting to see Europa has a personality, right? It's a real world in its own right. Um, so yellowish cast on the surface, but very smooth. Don't see any impact craters. It doesn't look like the Earth's moon and it has some weird lines on it. So Voyager 2, which followed soon after, launched in 77, closest approach in 79, took very high resolution images of Europa, so very close up images and also color images. And so again, on the right hand side, you can see now Europa, first time we really saw the surface of Europa and how bizarre and alien it is, right? It doesn't look like anything we've seen anywhere else in the solar system, didn't look like anything then, we still haven't seen anything else like it. And that's one of the reasons it's so intriguing to geologists like me. So the voyages were incredible missions. They didn't just visit Jupiter, they visited Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. They took pictures of the moons. Uh, they are still going. Um, they both now left the solar system. I think one left the solar system a couple of weeks ago, actually, or at least we think it did. So you know, they are now both in interstellar space, still going, absolutely incredible after all this time. So the voyages then paved the way for the next mission set. So this is how it works in planetary science. Everything you do, builds on the last mission. And every time we, t we fly new missions, we just find more puzzles to solve. We have new questions to ask. So the Voyagers uh, just created a lot of questions that were then answered by the next main mission. Um, oh, Galileo, sorry, I forgot I had this slide in here. So this is just a, another closer view of Europa. Um, one thing I wanna point out, because I'm gonna come back to it later, is you can see on the right-hand image, these lines, some of them are sort of they, they're tabular, they're kind of like band-like. And it was suggested um, just from this particular image actually that some of the surface might be moving around a little bit like plate tectonics on the Earth. Um, and those of you that know about plate tectonics on the Earth will know that that really was only proven in the 60s and we're looking at these uh, you know, in the 70s and 80s. So it's still a fairly new idea if people are trying to sort of understand how it worked. But some people suggested that the surface of Europa might be moving around in big broken plates, and it certainly looks like it here. So this is what the, the Galilean satellites looked like after Voyager, right? This is the family portrait, just to compare them to the Galileo little stars. So finally, we've got these four worlds in their own right. Um, very amazing, but lots of questions, and it was it was realized by mission planners that they certainly um, you know, deserved more study. And so that took us to the Galileo mission. And so Galileo is again, a phenomenally successful mission to the outer solar system. It's a, the last big mission that we flew to the, um, at least to the Jupiter moons. Um, Galileo was a, quite a troubled mission though, it has to be said. Um, the Challenger um, explosion happened uh, around the time Galileo was supposed to launch and everything was grounded for a couple of years. And so the Galileo spacecraft, which was ready to launch, uh, ended up sitting in basically a warehouse uh, somewhere for a couple of years. It had also been trucked across the country and back uh, twice. And by the time it was launched, it was sort of past some of its design lifetime, right? You, you build something, you expect it to you know, last in a certain environment for a certain amount of time. And what happened was it was launched from the Space Shuttle Atlantis once they began um, flying the shuttle again. Um, but you can see on the left, this is an artist's impression of, Gal of Ga the Galileo spacecraft. And you'll see this sort of umbrella-like thing that looks a little bit sad. It's, it should have opened all the way, like it's a big antenna. It's a dish, just like a TV dish that you might have your satellite cable uh, using. But because it had been sitting on the ground for so long, um, not in the environment it was supposed to be in, which is space, uh, the antenna didn't open properly. And because the antenna didn't open properly, it meant that um, the spacecraft could only send back maybe 10% of the original data that it had planned to send back, uh, which was a huge shame. It was still a fantastically successful mission, but we didn't learn nearly as much about the Galilean moons that we thought we were going to learn. So anyway, you'll see on the right, this is uh, something I'm going to talk about later. Um, it's called chaos. We found the surface of Europa was extremely bizarre and unusual, even at the highest resolution. And this is um, an area where the surface seems to be broken up into plates, very, very unusual. 
Um, and just this is a uh, oh, so let's pause for questions from the audience. Okay, let's pause. All right. So I think I'm supposed to mute myself for a moment. Yes, if you would, please. And if you have any questions for our presenter, you can type them into the chat at this time. We did have a question earlier in the chat from Carolyn, and I wonder if you can, you can answer it. If not, we can um, go on. Uh, and she was wondering, how long do we speculate that we might still receive images from the Voyager satellite, or the Voyager probes? Um, that's an excellent uh, question. And unfortunately, the only data that the Voyager probes are sending back now is um, particle data. So it's measuring the very um, occasional uh, sort of energetic particles, basically molecules, atoms, things like that, um, that are in the interstellar space. It's, it, it, once it got out of the solar system, it got away from the sun's uh, influence. And so now it's just sending back this particle data. Um, the Voyagers did not carry cameras in the way that we think of cameras. It carried TV cameras. And they are, they use a lot of data. They use a lot of power. And so the further the Voyagers get away from the Earth, the harder it is to measure their signals. The signals are tiny at this point. And it's always amazing to me that we measure them at all. And so, and also it's, the Voyagers um, are operating on nuclear power sources that have a half-life. And so they have decayed so much that it can barely, each of the, the spacecraft can barely transmit at this stage. And so unfortunately, it's been a long time since we got any images from Voyager. Um, but that's an excellent question. So yeah, it's really down to a trickle at the moment. It's just amazing that they're still doing anything. Okay, thank you. That, I agree with you. It is really amazing. So uh, Keith M has a question, and, I, and I'm mm -hmm. going to ask for some clarification on this, Keith, and hopefully I get it right. He says, or he asks, was the data that was unable to be sent back saved on the probe? And I think he's oh. referring to Galileo. Yes, he is. Um, that, Keith, that's a really excellent question also. Um, unfortunately not, because Galileo had another, another problem as well, which was not only did the antenna not open properly, but it had a tape recorder, not unlike the tape recorders some of us are familiar with, you know, that we used to rewind over and over again. And the tape recorder also had some issues and used to get stuck. And so it was a, quite a challenge to figure out what data to acquire. You know, where do you point your camera? Where do you point your instruments? What what data do you take? And then decide how much of that to send back. And we had to keep rewriting over the tape recorder. You know, we couldn't uh, keep the data. We would fly by one of the moons, take data, and then have to record over it again, unfortunately. We, we're a lot better now with the, the sort of uh, data storage devices. You know, I've probably got more in my thumb drive than, than Galileo had. I don't know if that's true, but it's, I think all the Galileo data will fit on one CD. Um, which should give you an idea of how little there was. But yeah, excellent question. All right, All thank right, you. I... Let's go ahead and have a okay. lot. Okay, thank you. And I know I'm already a little behind, so I'll try and speed up a little bit. I'll just get carried away, it's so exciting. Okay, so this is what the surface of Europa looks like. Um, as I mentioned, very few impact craters. The splotchy round thing on the bottom right is one of the few impact craters on the surface. And we think that surface age is quite young. So to a geologist, uh, it's only an average of 60 million years, um, which you know, to us mere mortals sounds crazy, but that's very young to a geologist. And we tell the time by counting the number of impact scars on the surface. Uh, we know something about how often comets and asteroids hit planetary bodies. And so we can count the size, uh, count the number and look at the size of impact craters and get the age that way. So we, we think Europa is very young and probably is active today. Um, the surface, I mentioned the chaos already is another example on the right, uh, which we think is, is kind of icy volcanism coming up from below. And on the left are these things called ridged plains. Most of the surface is one of these two types. The brownish mottled material is the chaos on the right and the, the bright linear features um, are covered by this ridge plains on the left and you can see the scale bars to give you an idea of how big they are. Um, one of the most exciting results from Galileo and possibly from any planetary mission ever was the Galileo 
uh, space car carried a magnetometer and the magnetometer measured a signal coming from Europa as Europa moved through Jupiter's magnetic field. Um, and what that means is there is a conductive layer beneath the surface that has been interpreted to be salt water, about 100 kilometers thick salt water ocean under the icy shell of Europa. And so this is an interior view. Uh, Europa has a sort of metallic core, just like the Earth, a rocky interior. So it's not unlike our moon, but then it's got this layer of liquid water, salty, and then a layer of ice on top. And so um, one of the big discussions among my community is how thick is the shell over the ocean? Like we all want to drill through the shell and get into the ocean. Um, but most of us think it's about 20 to 30 kilometers. There are a few people that think it's only a few kilometers, but it's probably 20 or 30 kilometers. And it's probably thick enough that the shell itself can move and convect and create some of the geology we see on the surface. Um, this ocean is huge, right? Although Europa is much smaller than Earth, this just shows you their relative sizes. Um, it's so deep compared to Earth's oceans. Earth's oceans are just a few kilometers deep and they cover two thirds of the Earth. Um, but Europa's is 100 kilometers deep and it's global. And so Europa has two to three times as much water as the Earth. It's really unbelievable. And so this makes it of great interest um, to the astrobiologists in the community. Um, why does it have a liquid water ocean, right? So most planets by now, you would think they're four and a half billion years old. They should be, you know, pretty dead, like our moon. We think it's fairly dead, not, no activity. Um, I think you can see this little gif here. Um, I mentioned this mathematician, Pierre Laplace. He discovered very early on that the, the three innermost moons of Jupiter actually are in this weird dance where they interact with each other. So Io actually goes around four times but every time Europa goes around twice and Ganymede goes around once. And what that does is each time they go by each other, they tug on each other and they keep each other in these very slightly eccentric orbits, right? This is called the Laplace resonance. Um, it's really unusual. And there's this eccentricity just means that the orbits are a little bit elliptical, a little bit oval. Um, and if I go to, maybe go to the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, did I, what did I do? Did something I didn't mean to do. No worries, we'll get back. Hang on a minute. Uh, yeah, on current slide. Resume slideshow. Okay, so this eccentricity, as we call it, um, it has the result of the, the moons. Um, I mentioned that Europa is mostly tidally locked, but one face is pointed towards Jupiter all the time. But it, it's not exactly true because it's in a slightly elliptical orbit. And so it kind of rocks from side to side um, because of the, the sort of oval orbit. And that rocking from side to side has the result of moving the interior of Europa and warming it up. It's called tidal heating. Um, if you have a paperclip handy, and while I'm talking, you want to take the paperclip and just start bending it back and forth, back and forth, you'll, you'll notice it gets warm. It's exactly the same thing. You're imparting this tidal energy into Europa. And that heat is what keeps the ocean liquid. That's why it's not frozen throughout. So tidal squeezing. Um, and this is interesting for the four big satellites, the Galilean satellites. I mentioned that Voyager discovered volcanism on Io. Io is the most active body in the solar system, far more active than the Earth. It has volcanoes that were going off in between flybys of Galileo. Within a few months, a new volcano would pop off, and you could see it on the surface. Um, Io is closest to Jupiter. Callisto is furthest away. Callisto is very old, and nothing has happened to Callisto except impact, impacts onto the surface of 4.6 billion years. Io, there's no impacts on Io that we found. It's just volcanism. It's just popping off all the stuff all the time. And Europa and Ganymede are somewhere in between. And so the amount of tidal energy um, that gets imparted into a satellite affects the geology we see on the surface. And so the highest tidal energy, most energy is at Io, very volcanically active. Some tidal energy at Europa, very volcanic, also has what we call tectonism, where the surface is broken in different ways. It's brittle sort of deformation. And then um, as you get further away with less tidal energy, you get to just impact craters. There's no energy to do anything else except just sit there and get hit with stuff from space. It's pretty sad if you've done the Callisto, I have to say. 
Um, so you open surface, we think it's mobile. This is a, just a gorgeous uh, mosaic um, from Galileo Images. Um, this is what some of those linear features look like if you get up close to them. They're really weird, these strange double ridges. Uh, and if you look at the scale bar, you can see that they're maybe one or two kilometers in width, and they're, they're double, there's two of them, and there's a big trough in the middle. Um, and we have no idea how they formed. I think there are currently eight different models um, that we try and explain how these ridges form, and we just don't know. They do move along the trough in the middle, um, and they may be related to heating, like frictional heating. If you rub your palms together, they get warm. And sometimes the edges of these ridges, one, one ridge crest will move relative to the other one, a bit like the San Andreas Fault. Um, but they are one of the many, many puzzles of Europa. We don't really know how they form. They're just everywhere. And they form throughout the surface history of Europa. Um, another um, type of feature, and this is one that I've spent a lot of my career studying, actually. Uh, we call them pull-apart bands. So this is a, a big sickle shaped feature. It's about 30 kilometers in width. Um, and I mentioned, uh, if you look on the top left, that's that original Voyager image, which I think I mentioned people thought the surface was moving around. And we found with these bands that the edges of this feature, um, you can actually either with a pair of scissors, uh, you know, if you print this out on a piece of paper and take a pair of scissors and cut the band out, you can put the surrounding parts back together again. Um, now we do it in programs like Photoshop, but if I go to the next slide, um, on the right-hand side, you can see one of these bands where I've removed the band and the pre-existing structures, the things that were cut apart when the band formed, um, are put back together perfectly. It's like a perfect jigsaw puzzle. Um, and so how do we think these form? Well, on the Earth, if you're familiar with plate tectonics on the Earth, especially at mid-ocean ridges where new ocean crust is created, um, materials come up and there's a crack and they basically pull outwards and new crust is created and then it cools uh, and, and creates the ocean floor. And we think that's exactly what's happening on Europa. The main difference is that on the ocean, the crust just keeps on moving and moving and moving until it gets smushed up into mountains or it gets subducted at subduction zones, right? One plate pushed beneath another. Um, and so for a long time, we didn't know on Europa where everything was going. We saw all these cracks that were opening up, but we couldn't tell where they were going. Um, so this was a big conundrum. I'm um, happy to say that uh, a colleague and I uh, did some work a few years ago where we think we found an answer. Um, we think we might have found subduction zones on Europa. So I know this is a very complicated uh, figure, and I don't expect you to really understand it, but the main part here is that uh, we were able to reconstruct some of these linear features on the surface where they've been displaced along cracks. And what we found was there was an area that we just couldn't reconstruct. The surface was missing about 100 kilometers, a big slab about the size, I don't know, about half the size of England um, that was completely missing. And what we think has happened is that that plate has been subducted. So the ice plates are subducting one beneath the other on the surface of Europa into the icy shell. And so this just shows you an artist's artist impression of what that might look like. And then, of course, on the right-hand side, we've got the Earth example of the mid-ocean ridges and this whole uh, conveyor belt of plate tectonics where you create new material, you subduct it, um, usually at island arcs or in, in, in trenches, you subduct one plate beneath the other. We think that's what's going on on Europa. And so if this is true, um, Europa is the only other body in the solar system other than the Earth that has all the um, elements of plate tectonics. And so the, the, the plates really seem to be mobile. And that also explains why it's not covered in craters, right? If it had craters, they've all been uh, removed, subducted beneath the surface, uh, right? Most of them, there's only a few left. Um, volcanism on Europa is a little different from volcanism on the Earth. We're used to big fiery volcanoes at Hawaii and Mount St. Helens, you know, uh, lots of rock and uh, fiery ash. On Europa, um, volcanoes are primarily made of liquid water with some kind of antifreeze in them, uh, which makes them quite interesting because, of course, as anyone who's ever had a gin and tonic will know, ice floats, right? And so we're trying to create volcanoes uh, on the surface of an ice shell. We're trying to make liquid water go onto the top of ice, and, and usually it just wants to be the other way around. And so there's two ways of doing this. One is um, by making it 
relatively buoyant, and so we actually call this warm ice, slightly warm compared to the rest of the icy shell. And the other um, way is to, as I mentioned, add some kind of antifreeze or both. So here on this image, you can see these little spots. Um, originally, we thought they were maybe craters, but they're not craters. They, they don't uh, match the characteristics of impact scars in any way. But we actually think they're little volcanoes that have popped up from beneath the surface. Um, I mentioned this chaos a few times, and it's this sort of orangey mottled material. Uh, this region, Connemara chaos, uh, by the way, all the chaos on Europa is named for stone circles on the Earth, so most of which are in uh, Europe. But, so this one's named for Connemara in Ireland. But if I zoom in where this white box is, this is um, what the, the surface looks like at high resolution. And so you can see um, a lot of definition in these plates, really an incredible um, surface. And all of those lines um, are actually pre-existing ridges and bands, like I talked about a moment ago, that have been broken into plates. And these plates have actually moved around. Some of them have moved um, for maybe up to a kilometer or they've rotated. So even though we're at freezing temperatures on the surface, and the minute anything comes out onto the surface, it wants to start freezing, um, this region was mobile enough that these plates can actually move and rotate and separate from each other. Um, I'm just going to zoom in on this little guy here. Um, I see, oh, sorry, I see we just got a question about how fast are they moving. We have no idea, right? We can only see now. We're like detectives looking at a crime scene. Um, all we know is, is what, what it looks like now. We have to try and figure out how did it get to look that way. Um, so we don't know. What we, the only constraints we know on the rate of movement of anything on Europa is the fact that the overall surface is about 60 million years and the chaos seems to be young. If we map the sequences of how things form, the chaos seems to be young. But we don't know whether young means 1 million years, 10 million years, or 50 million years. Um, again, in the, in the relative age of the solar system, it's young, but we don't know when that happened. Um, just showed you this. Um, this is uh, just again a zoom in of one of those plates. And if you look carefully down the bottom, you can actually see sort of the cliff edge and material that's um, just come off the edge of the cliff. We call that mass wasting in geology. And this scale bar shows you 500 meters. I was trying to find something that was 500 meters that would fit here um, to show you the scale, and I wasn't doing a very good job. I think the Eiffel Tower is a little bit less. The Sears Tower in Chicago, I think it's 440 meters, but uh, if you were walking around on the surface, it would be quite a slog, I think, and it's, of course, freezing. It's, um, what is the surface of Europa? 120 Kelvin, the surface of Europa. So this just shows you um, basically the model for how we think the volcanism on Europa works. Um, material uh, moves up in these big blobs uh, from the ocean. So you see on the bottom right, so the very lower end, the ocean, of course, is liquid water. So, um, you know, it's, it's room temperature um, or a little bit colder. And then that drives convection in the ice shell. If the ice shell is 20 or 30 kilometers thick, it's thick enough to convect, um, just like, um, you know, bubbles in a, a saucepan of soup as it starts to boil. And so we think that what happens is these blebs of ice come up to the cold surface uh, which is, a, you know, it's, it's in the vacuum, it's very cold, and they break the surface into plates. And that's how we think that these chaos regions form. So really, really interesting um, and a, a unique um, kind of process. Again, we haven't seen this anywhere else. Uh, we don't know a lot about what that antifreeze is. We don't know a lot about the composition of the surface. This is something that's very important. Um, Galileo uh, did have a near-infrared mapping spectrometer, which is an instrument that kind of measures the compositional fingerprint of the surface. Um, it uses reflected light in certain wavelengths uh, to tell something about what the surface is made of. But the radiation at Jupiter really wasn't kind to that instrument. It had a lot of noise and it was very hard to actually pull out a signal and figure things out. But you can see on the right hand side, this is just a, a, a what we call a spectrum or several spectra um, of this area on the left that's sort of reddish. Uh, in the visible. And we can tell from the shape of this line uh, that on the surface of Europe we have uh, magnesium sulfates, um, basically Epsom salts, 
Uh, and we also have a lot of sulfuric acid hydrate, which is uh, something that is created on the surface from sulfur uh, that is properly stripped off Io and deposited on Europa and then fried by the Jovian radiation, by Jupiter's radiation. So we don't, and then there's red material. We don't know what the red material is. Uh, we know there are different kinds of salts on the surface, but we just don't know much about them. So um, that's one of the things that we really need to look into. Uh, one other uh, thing about volcanism is that a few years ago, um, colleagues uh, using the Hubble Space Telescope uh, noticed um, evidence, or sort of that they inferred to be water ice plumes coming out of Europa. So similar to what we've seen on Io, but on Io they, they're sulfur mostly. Um, but they thought they'd found concentrations of hydrogen and oxygen ions that could mean that there was a, a water plume coming out of the surface. And if you look at the second box from the lower right, uh, you'll see this is a, an actual image of the Enceladus plumes. Enceladus is one of the moons of Saturn. And this image was taken by the Cassini spacecraft. Uh, so Enceladus has water ice, uh, sorry, water plumes coming out of it. And so now we're, we're wondering whether Europa does as well. So we're still trying to verify whether there are actually plumes at Europa. It's, it's uh, well, I think the jury's still out on that one. So we've learned a lot about Europa, but there is still a lot of different questions. And so um, I'm going to just talk about those maybe for the last 10 minutes and talk about the future exploration. One of the main ones is, is Europa active today? Does it have plumes? Is it actually, um, you know, is the surface moving around still today? We know it has happened in the past, but is it happening today? Um, we don't know if the ocean interacts with the surface directly. Um, it may be that the ice shell is such an effective barrier that you might be able to move things around in the shell and onto the surface, but we don't know if they go back down to the ocean. And even that subduction model I showed you um, that we came up with, we think that plates uh, dive into the shell, but we don't know if they get through the shell into the ocean. Um, that one could be important for understanding if there's life in the ocean, would we detect it on the surface? Um, this tidal squeezing that is so prevalent, we don't know um, really how the, the features, these linear features, form on the surface and how they relate to tidal stress. We don't know the compositions of the features. We don't really know how the ridges and chaos form. We have a lot of ideas, but we don't know for sure. Um, we don't know if there are safe places to land. Galileo was not able to take much very high resolution data. Um, the best data it took, it took six images, 12 images actually in two places, um, where it could resolve something that was maybe the size of a large room and that was it. So if you're putting a lander down on the surface, um, you know, you need to know at the lander scale how rough the surface is. Um, and we don't know if Europa is a habitable world. I, know, I don't say there is it habited, inhabited, it might be, we don't know. Um, but right now, we, we, even the first step, is does it have uh, the conditions that life could exist in? We don't know. So all of this, um, you know, just the habitable world question especially, has led to plans for future exploration. So this is just to reiterate that point. We know there's life on Earth, of course. Wouldn't be talking to you now if there weren't. Um, we think that Mars may have had past conditions for life, certainly liquid water. It was warmer and wetter in the past. And we don't know if Europa has present conditions for life. Um, so is it a habitable world? Does it have the ingredients for life as we expect them to be? Okay, and of course, we have to go on our own experiences and what we know we need for life as human beings. Um, so it's a very human-centered approach. But we know that Europe has more water than all of the Earth's oceans. And of course, life on the Earth originated in the oceans. The oceans are, are crucial for us to survive. Uh, we think that Europa has essential elements, either from its formation, it has the same elements essentially that the Earth has. They might be distributed a bit differently, but it's still got the same elements that we do. And things have been hitting it for four and a half billion years, just as they've been hitting the Earth. So elements could have been brought in from outside as well on asteroids or comets, most of comets. Um, chemical energy, I haven't talked about this a lot, but we think that the ocean of Europa may be directly in contact with the rocky interior of Europa, right? The mantle of Europa. Um, and that is exactly the same as on the Earth's seafloor. So it is possible there are hydrothermal vents, there are colonies down there. It's possible there are cracks uh, where they're very warm um, and they're creating uh, 
hydrothermal circulation, right? We don't know what's in the ocean, but we think it's quite likely that there are cracks in the um, mantle, in the silicate part of the rock, the rocky part, uh, that are in, immediately interacting with the ocean, and that's, that's quite a big deal. And so that can create certain types of chemical um, compounds that we call reductants, and on the surface of the ice, the radiation from Jupiter can interact with the surface to create something called oxidants. And if those two can come together, if the ocean does communicate with the surface, um, it can create chemical gradients, and we need chemical gradients for life. So it is possible that Europa has the ingredients we need for life. And it's also been there, that ocean's been there for four billion years. Um, so it's had a lot of life, time for anything that might be developing in there to develop. We just don't know. Um, okay, so pausing again for questions before I get on to my last few slides. All right. So. I do have a question for you from Valerie Randall. She would like you to comment some more about the subducted plates. And her question is, what is presumed, if anything, to happen to the subducted plates? Do they melt? Yes. That is, again, uh, so this is so fun because you're asking, we're all asking really great questions. So Valerie, that's a really good question. Um, we've done some very simple calculations and what we think happens is the cold, the plate is the coldest at the surface. As soon as it dies under another piece of ice, it's already entering into um, a slightly warmer ice, right? And by slightly warmer, it might be like a degree or two warmer, but it's enough that we think that it just gets kind of absorbed into the ice. So it wouldn't necessarily melt, it wouldn't turn into liquid water, but it would, uh, we, we use this term subsumed, which is a wonderful word, uh, subsumption instead of subduction, because we think that the plate goes into the shell and then just kind of almost like dissolves into the shell, just becomes integrated into the shell. So it might mean that the shell actually is kind of layered, you know, with old plates that have just built up over millennia, maybe. But yeah, excellent question. Thanks, Valerie. For that. And Valerie had a second question too about the, uh, the temperature of the volcanic eruptions. What are your presumptions mm -hmm. about those? Well, they only need to be at the temperature uh, that, you, that water melts, right? Because we're, we see evidence on the surface of, um, I didn't show this because I didn't, didn't think I'd have time, but um, there is evidence that liquid has flowed on the surface. Uh, so it just needs to be um, basically liquid water, liquid enough to flow and pool into um, low areas, just like it would on the Earth. Um, so it's basically the, the temperature of water is, is all you need to move around on the surface if you've got some antifreeze in you. Otherwise, you're just going to immediately freeze when you hit the vacuum of space. So basically 273 degrees. All right. Thank you very much. Let's move on, and I'll keep track of any other questions we have. If you have any other okay. questions in the chat, we're going to have um, another question and answer period at the end of this. It's all yours. Okay. And thank you. And I'll try and make sure we actually leave some time. I'm sorry, I tend to get carried away. Okay, so future exploration of Europa. So since Galileo, um, even since Voyager, we knew Europa was a special place. And... NASA has been planning and studying missions to return just to Europa. Even the Galileo mission itself, after it finished its uh, original mission plan, which went to visit all four of the Galilean satellites, um, it went into what we call an extended mission phase um, and just studied Europa because Europa was so interesting. Um, and so ever since then, NASA has been studying mission concepts. I myself have been working on various mission concepts to Europa since 2004, and I was even late to the party. There were people studying them even before Galileo had ended. Um, Galileo, by the way, um, I think it finished in 2001 or 2002, but it went for a few years. Um, anyway, so this has been a, a long um, kind of tortured uh, story where we've been over and over again told, yep, yeah, we're definitely going to fly to Europa, and then, oh no, we haven't got money, or something else has happened. But finally, in 2015, NASA selected uh, a mission to go to Europa. It's called the Europa Clipper, named after the clipper ships of old, which were you know, these fast clips that went across the oceans um, to discover new things and open up new trade routes. So it's a wonderful name for this. And uh, when it was selected, it was thought this would cost about $2 billion, which is a lot for anything. It was certainly a lot for a spacecraft, but it would do incredible 
science. And so this is going to be the next mission to Jupiter. Um, the goals of the Clipper, so we always start with the science goals and then we select instruments and build the spacecraft to accommodate them, right? So the science always comes first. We want to understand the ice shell and the ocean. We want to understand the composition. We want to understand the geology. Um, we will investigate whether Europa is active today and we want to do reconnaissance. We want to take images of the surface at high enough resolution that we can prepare for a future lander and land safely. Um, this, I'm not going to go into all these, but this is just to show you that we have a very capable set of instruments, we call it a payload, very capable set of instruments on the Europa Clipper. Um, there are nine different experiments um, and we will do, uh, we'll measure the gravity field as well. And so we do everything from sniff the atmosphere, uh, look at the surface in lots of different wavelengths. If there are plumes there, we will even be able to fly through the plumes. Um, one of the very exciting developments is uh, we're flying a really capable radar and the radar we'll actually be able to sense through the ice shell. We don't know if we'll get quite to the ocean, uh, it depends how clean the ice shell is and how warm or cold it is, but we'll be able to get into the ice shell and actually see what's underneath some of these features we see on the surface. So are those plates subsuming, right, as Valerie just asked, or, you know, what is going on with the chaos underneath? Are there really plumes coming up beneath the chaos? Um, so there are a bunch of different instruments really going to study Europa in every possible way that we can. Um, this is uh, just an image of the spacecraft as it looks at the moment. The spacecraft um, is just finished its design phase and now we've just moved into the building phase. Um, so I apologize that these are red. I know it's not easy for everyone to see, but it was hard to label things. The main thing to notice here is that big round thing in the middle is the antenna. Remember the Galileo antenna didn't open properly? Um, we don't like to fly moving parts on spacecraft. And so this one is a fixed antenna. It's a big dish. It doesn't move. It doesn't open. It's open before we launch it. Um, but you'll notice that it's three meters wide. And right behind it is a boom that the magnetometer sits on that is five meters long. So you can hopefully imagine just from those how big this spacecraft is. It is massive, um, probably one of the biggest spacecraft ever flown to a planet. I think Earth spacecraft are often bigger, but it's pretty massive spacecraft. And the instruments are grouped in two clusters. One set looks forward. They are flying through the particle environment, um, tasting the atmosphere, things like that. And one group looks down. They're the remote sensing instruments. They view the surface in different wavelengths of light. The radar is pointing down with various other things. So all the instruments are going to be turned on at the same time, which is also something we weren't able to do with Galileo because the antenna wasn't open. We just didn't have the data um, to do that properly. And the, and the instruments also weren't located on the spacecraft in such a way that you could operate them at the same time. You need enough power to do that. So we've built that into this. Um, this is a view of uh, Europa from the side. Again, this is what the mission is going to look like. Originally, we wanted to go into orbit around Europa, but um, it's very hard to do that. It takes a lot of fuel to um, basically not fly into Jupiter, right? Jupiter is massive and Europa is tiny. And so um, the, la the more fuel you have, the larger your spacecraft is, the larger your spacecraft is, the bigger your launch vehicle has to be, the cost just keeps going up. So in the end, we compromised and we're doing what Galileo did, which is we go into orbit around Jupiter and we fly by Europa multiple times, about 42, 45 times, something like that. Uh, we haven't settled on that exactly. But you'll see just from this sort of web that we cover the whole surface of Europa just with multiple flybys. Um, and we build up the coverage that way. Um, there are some other benefits of this as well. Um, it minimizes the radiation dose. So the radiation tends to be in a sort of uh, horizontal plane around Jupiter. And by flying like this, we can fly in and out of the radiation plane. And that helps us survive for about three years. If we were in orbit around Europe, we'd survive between three months and a year. You know, we probably wouldn't guarantee we'd last past three months because the radiation will indeed fly the, ele fly the electronics eventually. Um, we are hoping to go on a rocket that doesn't exist yet, but it's in development. It's the, the space launch system. This is the rocket that's being built to take humans to Mars eventually. Um, we would like to go on the SLS because if we can, it's a really big rocket and it only takes three and a half years, just over three and a half years to get to Jupiter from Earth. 
Um, if we can't go on this rocket, we have to go on probably a different kind of rocket, maybe a commercial build that's smaller. And it's going to take us um, over six years to get there. And none of us are getting any younger. We've been waiting nearly 20 years for this follow-on mission. So, of course, we're greedy scientists. We want our data now. Um, we really would like to go as soon as possible. But it would be phenomenal if we can go on the space launch system. Um, so the launch period, uh, this is slides a little out of date. This says 2022. Our current launch date is 2023. Um, so we will be at Jupiter, in worst case, by 2030. Uh, seems a long way away, but it will be here fast. Um, and the best case, probably about 2027, 20, 28. Um, just a couple more slides. Um, we're not the only people going to the Jupiter system. The Europeans also have a spacecraft that they are building right now called JUICE, the Juice Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer mission. Um, their mission is going to primarily study Ganymede and Callisto. Um, there's a lot of history here that I don't have time to go into, but originally we were going to explore Europa and Io, and they were going to explore Ganymede and Callisto, and then our missions got out of sync. Unfortunately, money got in the way. Um, but JUICE arrives in the Jupiter system in 2030, uh, and it will go into orbit around uh, Ganymede in 2032. But before it does any of that, it's also going to make two flybys of Europa. And there's a chance we'll be in the system at the same time. It's unlikely we'll be at Europa at the same time, but it would be really amazing if we were. Um, just having two spacecraft measuring the Jovian magnetic field at the same time from two different places would be unprecedented. No one's ever done that before. So we, you know, we're not trying to um, work our missions around each other, but, but I think there's a good chance that we will be able to do some dual spacecraft science. And then the far future is a Europa lander. So this is uh, something that has been studied um, over the last few years, again, by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And uh, we're probably not quite ready to do it yet. There's no money for this mission as yet, and it hasn't yet been identified as a priority by the, the planetary community. But I think um, once we get results from the Europa Clipper, uh, we are going to want to fly a lander. And the lander would probably look for signs of life on the surface, or at least, you know, kinds of things that we expect to be associated with life. Um, so eventually that will happen, but we don't know when, probably, um, you know, 10, 20, maybe 30 years away, hopefully only 10, but we'll have to wait and see. So uh, I think that's pretty much where I'm at. Europa, um, hopefully I've, I've shown you what an absolutely fascinating world it is. It may be active today. Um, it is a potentially habitable world, one of the few in the solar system that we think has the right ingredients for life. Um, the Europa Clipper mission is, is underway, so that's happening right now, and uh, it will launch uh, in the next few years, so there will eventually be a lot of press about that, hope you remember that you heard about it here. Um, and we are very close to the next phase of Europa exploration, so it's a very exciting time to be a planetary geologist. And uh, thank you very much. Okay, so I guess I take, we can get some more questions? Okay. We do have some more questions. If you want to go ahead and advance through your slides. I don't know if you want to I'm actually, comment on these. I'm done. These, these are, yeah, these are just some backup slides. So I'm very happy to, um, this slide here is just showing some of the incredible landforms that we see on Europa and how unusual they are. So I just threw this in because I love it. But I'm actually, um, and this is just, uh, there are a few impact craters on the surface, but not very many. Um, this is one of the larger ones, um, but like I said, there's hardly any here. So it's really just these help us understand the ice thickness. So Outstanding. So we've well, really we got a bunch up. of questions. So I'll just jump okay. in and then I'll mute myself so that you can, you can talk. Uh, so I'm going to move oh, backwards, that's interesting. everyone. And um, that way we can go with the with the newest messages back to the oldest. So Keith M has a question, and it is: Does that mean that the flybys will be? be oh, sorry, we had we had a sound issue here. So um, please repeat the question. Can they hear us? We can hear you. So 
does that mean that some flybys will be, be between Europa and Jupiter with tidal locking that we have not been seen that has not been seen from that side of Jupiter that side of oh, Europa. Yes. Europa. Um, that's a really, really good question, actually. So I hope you can hear me. Okay, I'm now sitting in front of Christine's laptop because we had a horrible feedback effect. Um, we have seen both sides of Europa, but not well. Most, some of the map of Europa surface is the map that we made from Voyager. It's very, very low resolution, like as if we were a long way away. Um, but we will fly by... Europa on what we call the sub-Jovian hemisphere. It's the hemisphere that points towards Jupiter. Um, the problem is the radiation uh, can be quite bad there. And so we, the current plan is to do most of the flybys on the, what we call the anti-Jovian hemisphere, the other side of um, Europa from Jupiter, uh, for the first maybe half of the mission and build up as much coverage as we can there because we can answer a lot of science questions from one hemisphere. We don't necessarily need to see the whole surface to answer things like how do those ridges form, for example. Um, but, the, but the radar particularly um, has trouble with the radiation noise. So once we've answered a lot of the science questions, then we'll start flying by on the hemisphere that is closer to Jupiter and where the radiation is worse. We can, we can take more risk in the mission there. Um, so, yes, we are going to fly on that side, but we're not going to do it straight away. Excellent question. Thank you. So we have another question that's looking ahead to the future. Mm -hmm. Are there any instruments that could be deployed on a probe that could map the rocky subsea surface? Mm -hmm. That is also an excellent question. So I was actually um, part of a workshop, three-day workshop last year, where uh, there were about 30 of us in a room, maybe 15 scientists and 15 JPL engineers and we just brainstormed for three days about could you drill through the ice down to the ocean and what would you do in the ocean um, I think once we if we can get to the ocean there are actually a lot of earth instruments that people use to explore the ocean floor here that we could actually get you know use on Europa without too much trouble um, the problem is not once you're in the ocean it's getting to the ocean it's how do you drill through possibly 20 or 30 kilometers of ice. It's even on the earth. Um, you know, we had people at that workshop who would, who drilled through um, or were drilling into the ice in the Antarctic or the Arctic or Greenland ice sheet. And, you know, they take big teams of people. The drills are huge. I mean, the Russians have been trying to drill into Lake Vostok and they're right down. I think they've actually managed to contaminate a little bit of it now, but you know, it's taken them years and these massive drilling rigs. And so, we're in the space business. We're trying to miniaturize everything. Um, you know, one of my more fun adventures in grad school was I went, uh, I went down to the bottom of the ocean floor in the Alvin submersible, three-person three submersible. And we had a drill on the Alvin and we were trying to drill into the ocean floor, you know, with a guy with a joystick trying to start this drill that was bolted onto the sub. And we just couldn't get a good core. Um, if you're familiar with the Mars, um, <laughs> the MSL, uh, Mars Science Laboratory, MOLE. Oh, sorry, InSight. The InSight mission, MOLE, is currently trying to get a small core um, from the surface of Mars. And, you know, it's really, they can't even get it into the ground remotely. So it's just, all these things will happen, but maybe not for a century or two, unfortunately. Okay. All right, thank you very much. We have one more question. Okay. That would be, would the flybys be able to get global coverage of Europa? And if so, how would you do that? Oh, yes, they will. And that was, uh, we had to sacrifice, by, by making the choice not to go into orbit, we were sacrificing making global maps more easily. You can still make global maps and take global coverage with the flybys. You're just building it up in strips. But you can look from side to side under the spacecraft. So you can see a lot of the area beneath you. The only part we don't do completely, I think, is the poles. And that's quite normal because Europa, like most, you know, everything in the solar system is in the same plane, except maybe Pluto is a little bit of an outlier. But, um, and it's, it's just energetically very difficult to go over the pole of something when you are in orbit around it. It just takes a huge amount of fuel 
um, that we, you know, so you make trades on all these things, you decide what you're going to do. But yes, we will build up, um, we call it near global coverage, but I think it's going to be, I don't know the exact number, but it's probably going to be like 90, 95% or something. Uh, yeah, really, yeah, good question. Outstanding answer. Thank you very much. Uh, those are all the questions we have for right now. Could someone advance the slide for me, please? I'd like to thank today's presenter, Dr. Louise Proctor. And next slide, please. Also, thank you to the National Science Teaching Association for sponsoring today's program. And thank you to the administration of NSTA for their support for web seminars. We will conclude the program now.